talk is uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it's the Democratization of Initiation at Burning Man, a Cosmotheandric Inquiry. Um, Burning Man really inspired this talk, but there's a lot of background that I, I want to unpack for you. Um, so I'm not going to talk specifically about what I think uh, Burning Man is allowing to flower in our, our culture or our counterculture. Uh, until the end of the talk. Um, I want to begin by unpacking a few concepts, uh, one of which is uh, this notion of a social imaginary, which is a phrase that the philosopher uh, Charles Taylor coined, and that's really starting to catch on in sociology, just as another way of talking about what, it, what are sometimes called worldviews, um, cosmologies, cultures. I like the term social imaginary. Um, for one, just because I'm, I'm writing my dissertation on, on imagination, so it speaks to me. Um, and it seems to uh, give us a, uh, an understanding of that which is underlying the conscious ideas and beliefs that a culture has about itself. A social imaginary is, um, it, it has to do with what uh, Alfred North Whitehead called the imaginative background, which is sort of unconscious and it, it structures our, uh, our beliefs and our practices before we uh, I, before we know um, consciously what those uh, beliefs and practices are. So it comes before what we would call our worldview and how we would describe <coughs> what our worldview is. The social imaginary is, is beneath that and operates at a sort of subterranean level. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then I want to unpack another concept called uh, cosmopolitics, which is something that comes out of Whitehead's work also but has really been developed by um, two contemporary thinkers, uh, French um, sociologist of science and philosopher, Bruno Latour, and uh, another French philosopher, um, Isabel Stengers. So this notion of cosmopolitics is, attempt, is an attempt to break down the, the dichotomy between nature and culture, between uh, society and human society and the rest of the universe. Um, it's the idea that all of the, the universe is, um, in some ways, a cultural phenomenon. That there's learning taking place at the level of molecules, cells, animals, and of course, uh, at the level of human beings. But it's not unique to human beings. Then I'm going to talk about initiation, um, what that has meant historically for the for the ancients, and and how it continues to inform our culture today. And then I'm going to get into Burning Man and try to tie all of these ideas together. Uh, <laughs> so, begin with, with this notion of the social imaginary. Um, as I said, it was coined by Charles Taylor. Um, it's not the ideas or the theories that society has about itself. It's, it, it takes place at a deeper, often unconscious, imaginative level. Um, there's another theorist, uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, who just so happens to uh, to discover last week, because uh, Jake Jake Sherman left a book in the PCC office and I cracked <coughs> it open and there's an essay about exactly what I'm talking about today. So he says uh, that human history is in its essence defined by imaginary creation. And this isn't the same as like the social construction of reality. Um, it's it's not just, as I said, about human history. This is a, a what we do call a, a cosmo-historical process. Um, and I, I think 
what this notion points to is that imagination is in some ways a natural phenomenon. It's not a creation of human beings. In some sense, the imagination is what created the human being. You know, the cosmic imagination or the divine imagination. Um, so Castoriadis goes on in that essay I mentioned, uh, which was about Greek and modern democracies. He says, every society must maintain itself, preserve itself, defend itself. It is menaced by itself, its own imaginary, which, we can, which can rise up and challenge institutions as they already exist. So in other words, uh, every society has this, this imaginary, this uh, basic unconscious uh, set of structures that are informing its worldview. And while that um, set of structures will inform the mainstream culture, it will also inform the countercultures that emerge to challenge the dominant culture. Um, I think Burning Man is is an example of how um, there's both this process of rebellion against the mainstream, but it's also carrying forward uh, some of the same ideals that the modern West uh, has always held sacred. You know, individual expression, freedom, um, you know, this empowerment of, of the individual to create uh, the world from the sort of inner spark of their own spirit. I mean, this is taken to, a, to an extreme. It's, Burning Man is almost less than a countercultural event than a, a hypercultural event. Um, it's bringing to fruition the, some of the best parts of, of the modern Western psyche, I think. It's also different in other ways, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, so another really helpful concept in understanding um, a social imaginary, especially a democratic social imaginary, uh, is this difference that uh, Castoriadis, Castoriadis marks between a heteronomous society and an autonomous society. Heteronomous societies, uh, they believe that their law comes from outside, uh, from something other, heteronomous. And this could be God, this could be reason with a capital R, um, this could be the market with a capital M. And in these societies, um, there's no consciousness of the fact that history is an imaginative, imaginative process of creation. The society isn't autonomous in the sense that it realizes that it makes its own laws. An autonomous society knows this, and they consciously participate in, in the questioning and the interrogation of their laws anew in each generation. So there's you know, always going to be an inheritance from the past, but a heteronomous society doesn't question that inheritance. An autonomous society does. And is forced then, you know, to const to constantly, uh, you know, call into question its, its very reason for existing, and it and it comes from from within instead of being imposed from without. Um, in a heteronomous society, there's something we could call a, a closure of signification, which means that the structure of our language and our basic way of, of communicating with ourselves and with whatever it is that is informing the law be it God, reason, the market, um, that structure, or any question we can ask within that structure has an answer that's also within that structure. So there's no way to break out of the closure of signification within a heteronomous uh, society. Um, so the question becomes, how do you rupture this closure? And I think you, you could say that one of the places where, where such a rupture um, began was in ancient Greece and it emerged with philosophy and with democracy. Um, you know, a, a democracy knows that it makes its own laws, as I said, and it's not afraid to put them into question continually. But there's this paradox now, because you know, Greece was where democracy first flowered, but it was also where uh, philosophy first flowered, and you know, perhaps the most important philosopher in history, Plato, who Alfred North Whitehead said you know, all of Western philosophy is but the footnotes uh, to Plato. Um, you know, there are other important figures, obviously, but he's really central. He was pretty hostile to democracy, it would appear at first sight. Um, and, you know, he despised democracy because in a democracy, as it was defined in Athens, um, 
there's this understanding that it's based on opinion. The, the opinion of the majority is what will determine the laws. Uh, the Greek word is doxa, opinion. Um, and Castoriadis writes that uh, the postulate of the uh, prima facie equivalence of all doxi, of all opinions, is the sole justification of the majority rule. And so for Plato, if you look at in the Republic, he has this hierarchy of knowledge. And, um, opinion is pretty low on that, on that hierarchy. Um, and so because Plato didn't value just the opinion of the rabble, so to speak, he didn't think that democracy was uh, a valid way of government. Um, but I would argue that, that Plato, uh, this doesn't necessarily make Plato a, a totalitarian thinker, as, as he's often been accused of being. Um, he was simply against a polity that was ruled by popular opinion, um, that was ruled by pop culture, you could say. Yeah. Because for him, you know, pop culture is, is a culture that hasn't been initiated into these deeper structures of reality and of the universe, the ideas, the forms. Um, and a culture that was initiated, or individuals in a culture that were initiated into this deeper uh, layer of reality, the, the, the ideas and the forms, um, would model their, their polis um, after that ideal realm. And for Plato, it was the heavens, it was the stars and the planets and their ordered, orderly motion through the sky that, that, that should inform uh, the way we structure our society. Because, you know, on Earth, in the polis, if it's just our opinions and we're all sort of, you know, facing each other, there's this, this sort of, um, you know, chaos that can emerge. Like, this is my opinion, that's your opinion. How do we arbitrate between these? Well, there's the majority rule, but we all share the same sky. And by Plato thought, by looking at the sky and looking at the um, perfect order um, of their motions mathematically, we could in be informed by something that's transpersonal and not simply personal, as you know, personal opinions would be. Um, so you could say that Plato was a cosmopolitical thinker, meaning that he saw a society that was shaped by, by wisdom, and one of the ways that wisdom is reflected is, is in the motions of the, of the heavens. Um, so he felt that the stars should be the ethical teachers of humanity and, and to inform our, our, our common life together. Um, so now a little bit about this, the notion of initiation. Um, you know, in our community, I think we're all pretty familiar with, with what this word might mean. Um, <coughs> I think for the ancients, and, and still today, it has a lot to do with, with an encounter um, with death, and with the death-rebirth mystery, and with passing through that threshold um, where you know the physical body dies, the physical <coughs> senses are no longer operative. And for Plato, who was an initiate into the uh, Eleusinian mysteries, um, it, it was death that, that provided insight into the eternal nature of the soul. Um, and in modern culture, death has sort of become um, a profanity. You know, we don't like to look at it. We don't like to talk about it. Uh, we run away from it. We do everything we can, medically and cosmetically, uh, to cover it up, to avoid it, to prevent it. While I think in the ancient world, nothing was more sacred um, than death. You know, death was the portal where the wisdom of of eternity you know, would pour through if only we could uh, you know, prepare ourselves uh, to see that. And this is what initiation was about. Um, we don't know much about what actually took place at uh, uh, the Eleusian Mysteries because it, the initiates were sworn to secrecy. However, you know, various tidbits uh, snuck out here and there. Um, the first tragic poet, uh, Aeschylus, was accused of telling the secrets in one of his plays. He denied that uh, and claimed he wasn't an initiate, but he lived in, uh, in uh, Eleusius, and it seems that he did have some knowledge um, of what was going on uh, in this, this mystery cult, um, and it, it seems to have something to do with, uh, well, it, it has to do with the myth of Persephone. 
uh, he travels to the underworld and, and meets Hades and ends up um, victorious and, and ends up the queen of heaven, or, sorry, the queen of hell, uh, when all is said and done. And, and it, it has to do with uh, the, the process of um, fertility of, of vegetation, I think. And you know, on the on the plant on the level of plants, you can really see this death re rebirth mystery taking place, and the mo the movement from seed, you know, to flowering to fruiting, to seed again. And you know that you know the seed is in some sense the, the carcass of the living plant, but it was understood as soon as the agricultural revolution took place that the seed is actually containing a new life, and that there's a continuity from the death of the plant to its rebirth. So it's clear on the plant realm that there's this death, rebirth, continuity. In the animal realm, I think it's more difficult to recognize that, which is why the, these initiatory processes were necessary to remind um, the soul. You know, animals, they have anima, they're, they're in soul. And I think, um, especially for human beings, there's this, you know, as, as we know so well from, from Stan and Rick's work, there's this birth trauma. And Plato wrote quite a bit about the trauma of birth and how it caused the soul to forget its origin and eternity. Um, and so these initiatory cults were uh, probably um, assisted by some sort of uh, psychedelic. There are many theories that anything from uh, mushrooms that may have been growing in the fields to uh, a fungus called ergot that would grow on the rye. Um, and you know some depictions are that they would take these substances, take the, one of these substances, go into a cave, and have this sort of um, you know the, the the priests and the priestesses would create this sort of uh, dramatic setting where they would try to scare the initiates in this dark place, make them think that demons were surrounding them in a cave, and then just when they were you know the, the um, you know people to be initiated were completely freaking out and feeling like the world was closing in around them, like, you know, um, sort of BPM2 space, they would then, you know, provide a light at the end of the tunnel, and then it would open up into this glorious revelation where the walls would be painted with, you know, these beautiful scenes of, of um, you know, of heaven, and of, um, uh, a sense, it would give them a sense of unity with the cosmos, and so they would, you know, move from thinking that death was, that they were dying, and that was the end, to being open to this new expanse. Which was supposed to inform them and remind them, remind their soul that this is what will happen when you die, and that you have died before as well. Um, so, Eleusis was kind of considered for the ancients this this dream realm um, because the mysteries were were uh, what took place there. I, I think every spring. Um, Hesiod uh, referred to this sort of mythical city of Elcyon, which um, sounds a lot like Esalen, actually. But it, it's it's the place where he said uh, the the happy dead uh, live. Uh, you know, happy dead. In other words, they die and realize that the soul lives on. Um, and Hesiod said that this this city of Elcyon, this mythical city, was located at the western ocean at the edge of the earth. And I think, you know, symbolically, Elcyon, it, it's been used in, by poets, you know, for, for hundreds of years just to represent this mythical city. It's kind of like Eden. Um, and in many ways, uh, Burning Man is a kind of dream <coughs> city, like Elcyon. Uh, it only exists for one week a year, and, you know, after that week, it's gone. It's a desert again. And it has that very temporary feel to it, that it's, it's almost not quite real. But it, I think it provides um, a place for the dreamers of our culture to go and try to imagine a new world and to try to um, make it permanent, not in the physical space where it exists for a week, but permanent in their soul as a reminder of, of what you know, the default world could be if, if they fully internalize the initiatory experience that takes place there. Um, so, you know, as I said, Plato wasn't very... Um, impressed with democracy that was based on just doxa, based on opinion. But I think this was because you know a democracy without initiation would lead to mis misguided opinions about what is of true value. 
uh, a culture that thinks that death is is the end and that all we get is this one life is going to value different things than a culture that understands that we are one generation and that the next generation uh, and you know generations upon generations are in some sense carrying forward the same um, the same spirit that is existing within us now. You know, so it's it's one thing you know to to base our the ethics of a civilization on the idea that we should prepare for the next generations, and you know that could motivate some people to be more ecologically conscious. But you know, I think a deeper understanding and initiation into the reality of reincarnation would make that uh, you know easier for people to understand. You know, why should I really preserve the earth? Well, because I'll be here again. I want to keep this place uh, healthy enough that it can sustain, you know, generation upon generation of reincarnation. Um, so, in, in some ways, the initiatory experience forged the soul's confidence um, in its eternal life and in its freedom and in its creative power, and it it, it, it allows for. Uh, a break in this closure of signification as well. There's a whole new realm of meaning opens up when we realize that the, the sense-bound uh, intellect isn't the end-all and be-all of our existence, that in fact there's a soul um, behind that, which for a large part remains unconscious during life, that continues um, and that has more you know, cosmic power that it's inherited for billions of years than, than what our limited ego uh, makes us believe. So now let's get to Burning Man, try to tie these ideas together. Um, Burning Man takes place on Labor Day, and I think you know, people go there for a vacation in large respects, to sort of be off the clock uh, and to relax. And it's kind of funny though that they go to the, there to be off the clock, and the Burning Man is a giant clock. Um, and I think it's a sort of symbolic where instead of uh, time being a sort of oppressive structure that, that hems us in, um, it becomes a stage uh, to play. Um, and it, and it, time becomes sort of uh, mythic again, and it has this cyclical quality where you don't need to forget what day it is. You know, obviously you know from the cycle of the moon and the sun that the time is passing, but you don't care if it's Wednesday or, or Friday, or it doesn't matter anymore. Um, you know, you want to remember when the man's going to burn, but it's pretty hard to forget. Um, so th there's this, uh, this beautiful quote by um, a Jewish theologian, theologian Franz Rosen, uh, Rosen's wife. He says that in the struggle for time, state and art must destroy each other since the state wishes to stop the flow of time, while art would drift in it. So the state, again, would be that um, uh, oppressive authority which tries to maintain the closure of our systems of signification, um, whereas the artist is always trying to um, you know, break free of any closure uh, and just sort of um, play with time instead of feeling as though they have to work as though they're on the clock. Um, and it's not, you know, clock time in our industrial civilization has a lot to do with uh, money, too. You know, time is a measurement, it's used now as a measurement of, of money, of how much money we're being paid. And one of the most uh, beautiful things about Burning Man is, in many ways, one of the most um, shocking things about it is that there's no money exchanged on the playa, um, except for ice and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that, you know, as I said, this is, this is hypercultural. It's not completely countercultural. Like, you need our coffee, and obviously you're in the desert, you need ice. And, and all those profits are donated. Yeah. To the local communities. Look at that. All those profits are donated <laughs> to the local communities. 
profits from the ice and the coffee are donated to the local communities in Nevada, the school system. Uh, and there's been there have been several dissertations written on on what's happening uh, at Burning Man. Um, there's a, an anthropologist named Lee Gilmore who um, recently published her dissertation. It's called uh, "Theater in a Crowded Fire." Ritual and Spirituality at Burning Man. Um, and she, what she you know, really argued in her dis dissertation was that this um, Burning Man provides that growing sector of society that identifies as spiritual but not religious with uh, an opportunity to participate in a collective ritual uh, and to, to gain that, that same sense of the communal ethos that um, we've lost as traditional religions have fallen by the wayside. Um, so it's both, you know, the, uh, there's, there's three, you know, basic principles that Burning Man, ethical principles that Burning Man tries to embody. Uh, one of those is uh, radical inclusion, which is that communal element. One of them is um, self-reliance, which is, you know, we want to be um, fully capable of being responsible for yourself at the same time that you're fully capable of holding everyone else's uh, unique expression of, of who they are in mind. And, and it's amazing to watch at Burning Man how so many different people from different sectors of society with different you know, types of day jobs, they come there to express their own unique understanding of, of what spirit is and what spirituality is. And there's this beautiful temple structure that's built every year. It's always different. This year it was the first year that the temple was taller than the man. Way taller. 120 feet. The man was what, 60, yeah, 60 or 70 feet. And I think this is symbolic. Um, the culture that's being born in uh, the Black Rock Desert is becoming more conscious of itself as uh, some type of pilgrimage, some type of, I think, a prototypically American religious movement. And this was also the first year that um, the Burning Man Corporation transitioned into a nonprofit that's now located uh, in downtown San Francisco around Civic Center. Um, and they're going to start working to um, revitalize the urban setting there using art um, and sort of radical participation in the artistic regeneration of, you know, the really. Um, degenerating sectors of San Francisco. I think they're really focusing on the Tenderloin in the Civic Center area. Um, a lot of the art that was built on the playa is going to be moved into the city. You can already see that taking place. Um, there's an iron, cast iron statue of some flowers that's right uh, in Civic Center now. And a beautiful statue of a uh, dancing woman that's lit from within with this purple light that's on Treasure Island. You, you should go check out. Um, Maybe you could leak over a little bit, a few more blocks over to CIS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, like this mythical city of Elcyon, um, Burning Man is this dream that lasts temporarily, you know, not quite just overnight, but, you know, for, for several nights every year. And then it dissolves away again back into the desert, but I think the images social imaginary that it that is generated there in, in the souls of those who participate gets carried back into the world uh, and you know there's been some criticism of um, of Burning Man for you know the way that it's become popular in, in recent years it's it's ballooning it sold out for the first year uh, ever this year 50,000 people and um, there's this growing phenomenon of what some some bloggers I was reading have called uh, P2P, play, uh, pay to play, where you know rich people will just buy into these compounds of RVs that are stocked and staffed, and um, they're not really creating anything. You know, they're just coming, they're paying to be there to see you know the extravagance and the, um, you know to check out the scene without actually adding anything to it. Um, so that's, that's happening, and, but I think the more those kinds of people go, and if they keep coming back, I'm convinced that they will be transformed by that experience and realize that, oh, I actually want to participate. I don't want to just pay to play. Uh, you know, I want to I help 
out. I want to be artistic and I want to express myself. Um, in many ways, I think there are a lot of elements, you know, perhaps the positive elements of capitalism that are coming um, to the playa and, and giving this arena to play in that isn't driven by money and consumption. It's driven by gift giving and participation. Um, normally capital is defined as um, sort of profit that is skimmed off the top of the exchange that goes on in a society. Um, and I think that there is still, there is a profit that each person gains at Burning Man. It's not monetary. It's a profit in um, a self-esteem that's generated uh, and, and um, love that's generated. Um, you know, and, and the encounters that people have with one another on this really authentic level that can't take place in the default world when you're on the clock, when every social exchange is mediated by money. Um, in the default world, money is really what has created a closure of signification. We really have a hard time communicating with one another. I mean, maybe not with our friends, but even there, whenever money gets involved, it's like, whoa, how do we deal with this? But with, with strangers in the, the public sphere, money is how we communicate with one another. And it's, it's a communicative disorder, I think, that, that alienates us from one another, alienates us from nature, because we think that the only value is what can be measured in dollars when you know, the natural world is not uh, reducible to units of currency. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that Burning Man is allowing the the good parts of capitalism, the free expression, um, and the free the free market to to unfold, but it's it's unfolding on an artistic level, on a playful level, instead of on a level of work and labor, um, and money and consumption. You know? um, and there's also this issue of the amount of money required, though, to get to the playa, so that you don't have to use money anymore. But as I said, <laughs> Burning Man is a dream. Right? It's not real. It doesn't last. It's not a lasting city. It's meant to provide a space uh, for us to have a week to reimagine what's possible so that we can then come back to the default world and do the hard work that's necessary to change the real world, the waking world. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to end it there so that we can, we can talk about some of this a little bit. Thank you. death rebirth con con continuity in that sense of being cyclical that, that you have sort of gotten out of burning it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Can you speak a little to the death rebirth? Uh -huh. Oh, it's not on. Uh, it looks like it's on. Try, try again. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Can you speak a little to the death rebirth um, sense of that continuity of being cyclical that you've experienced at Burning Man or that is created there or that maybe even your, our group tried to create in some way or another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there are a lot of <coughs> elements to, to how that comes out. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is just being uh, in the desert where you can fully take in the sky. Both, you know, there's this this polar this polarization that takes place between the daytime, where the sun is the dominant element of your experience, and it's literally melting you, you know. <laughs> and contrast that with when the sun sets, all the stars come out, and the sky holds you instead of making you hide and run to the shade. And, um, but then you see the sort of uh, connection between these, uh, you know, between the daytime and the nighttime. And you really feel into that, the death and the rebirth of the sun, and and how um, if it were always daytime, what an oppressive you know, uh, situation that would be. And yet the sun becomes something you really desire. I mean, it, it was kind of warmer this year, but last year it was really cold at night, and right before dawn is when it gets the coldest. And then you really you're praying out, you know, calling out for the sun to return, and it's just you know that sense of. The, the paradox of mythical existence where, you know, uh, 
nothing really stands still, so you, you, you never feel like you're really fully getting what you want, but you know it's always coming, and that what you don't want will never stay too long. You know, so there's that cyclical nature there. And the other thing is uh, the boundary between the sacred and the profane is constantly being called into question at Burning Man, because on the one hand, you'll have like this raging dubstep grungy music, and then you'll have this temple over here where there's beautiful chimes and gongs and people praying and chanting. And they exist side by side, and, and um, you know, and then there's, for me, the most spiritual experience I had there was uh, pork pies, actually. <laughs> and the way that, uh, you know, the spiritual heights are integrated with the intestinal depths and just having to share these um, bathroom facilities with people, like you, you can see the karma working itself out as you wait in line, you know, who has toilet paper, who remembered toilet paper, who's giving toilet paper to those that don't have it, and you know, it just, it really sunk in that that's where it's real, that's where, you know, people's hearts really burn. Um, so yeah, you know, just that mythical polarity between the sacred and the profane really comes out. And in terms of death and rebirth, I think the body is really uh, brought to its extremes there. And you realize, um, in some ways, how important it is to maintain this incarnation, this incarnated body. Uh, you realize how, how needy it is at the same time, how easily its health is disturbed. Um, It's just an observation more than a question, but it just um, it just struck me that Burning Man almost feels like a kind of staging of the original situation that the American people found themselves in. It's the frontier, yeah. In the sense that you're sort of alone in this hostile environment and you have to learn mm -hmm. self-reliance mm -hmm. in order to survive. And it's yeah. almost like it it has that quality of ritual to it almost. And mm -hmm. in those days, what's what's happening is that you're sort of repeating the original challenges that you that you faced in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there, there are so many beautiful elements to American culture that have been um, obscured by you know, the, the sort of industrial and, and economic um, imposition. You know, it's sort of, in many ways, it's an expression of, of those American principles, but in other ways, it sort of denigrates them. And I think they need to be redeemed, and it's in a ritualized frontier setting like this, where you wash away commerce and money, and uh, you're, you're able to rediscover what it is that made America great. And, you know, yeah. So I don't remember who was at Burning Man, or beforehand we talked about Gepser and different levels of consciousness, and you mentioned a lot of the mythical. Through this inquiry, do you feel like the mythical is more of what's present than the magical, like you did before? Or do you still feel like it's the blend of both? Um, there's, there's a lot of mythical, um, you know, circularity and, and polarity there, uh, as I was expressing with Kat, but magic is fully present. Um, you know, synchronicity, there's a synchronicity around every corner. Um, but there's, you know, the, the mental structure is fully present as well. This is a as chaotic as it seems, this is a really well organized event. You know, it's it's it, this is a beautiful city grid that they construct in the desert before anyone's there. I don't know how. I guess they start on one side and work their way out. But uh, and there's a lot of organization behind the scenes, as Mikey can probably tell you. Um, it's it's not you know there's an order underlying the chaos, and so there's that mental element, and most of the people there. Um, are um, computer scientists, computer engineers, programmers, software engineers. And, uh, there are a lot of scientists there, a lot of brilliant people that are, um, you know, they're spiritual and not religious because they're so scientific, but they're, you know, science has led them to the sacred in many ways. Um, so, you know, I don't want to inflate Burning Man too much, but it seems like you know, there's a transparency between all of these structures unfolding there that makes it somewhat integral. Yeah. John. 
creativity with their own desire to, to express themselves. Um, so that really, that's not something that I noticed as, as a shadow element. Um, you know, I think the, the, there's a leave no trace policy and it's great to see that you know, in the streets there's, there's never any trash anywhere. If there's a piece of plastic blowing away from someone's camp, you know, the first person to see it will run after it and grab it. Um, on Friday and Saturday night, the bathrooms, the porta potties get kind of gross. People leave beer cans in there and stuff. And, um, I think that's kind of reflective of how there's this influx of people that come just to see the man burn on the weekend. They haven't been there for the whole week to see the communal ethos uh, develop and really um, cement. And they're not as responsible as those who have been there all week. So they'll get drunk and they'll leave their, their beer bottles and stuff in the in the bathrooms. Um, but you know they're almost like tourists to this very temporary city. You know, so they don't take care of it as well as the permanent, you know, Hong <laughs> Kong residents. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there are shadow elements that need to be talked about. Yeah. A quick question: Did Plato or, or say the stars are teachers or something like that? Is 
If so, you know where? Where did you say that? Yeah. Uh, Epinomis, probably. Yeah, yeah. Epinomis. And, and in the laws, too. Uh, yeah. You refer to it in the laws. Um, and you kind of, I'm try, I, you're asking that makes me want to go back to the original and see exactly how he does it because I'm, I think his deep, deeper point is that the, um, do, the divine intelligence that informs the heavens and expresses itself through the heavens is what the human being and the philosopher's quest, uh, it, it, if we enter into that and participate in that divine intelligence, we become eternal as, as the stars are eternal. That's the, um, but there is this also this quality of the stars themselves being intelligence as you get it very strongly in, in Aristotle too. And in that sense, they, they, they kind of take on like their teachers as well as the orchestrating intelligence, the noose, the divine noose is the uh, teacher. So if you're asking this makes me want to look back and see exactly uh, how he negotiates that um, monotheistic, polytheistic, uh, I don't know if it's important to you, uh, this distinction you made about it's uh, spiritual but not religious, mm -hmm. uh, it flashed through my mind that um, it is a community, it has a sacred space, it has lots of private language, it has transformation of consciousness, it has a shadow, yeah. uh, <laughs> I can name about eight other elements that you mentioned, all of which are characteristic of religion. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that that anthropologist, Lee um, Gilmore, where I mentioned said is that we have to redefine how we think of religion. Um, I can't remember she said it, and I'll bring this to a close. Um, That's okay, I just wanted to raise the question. It's true. I, I, I think you're right about that. Um, well, the idea was basically instead of thinking of religion as being defined by dogma um, and belief, uh, Burning Man is pointing out to religious scholars that religion can also be embodied through, through practices, through experiences um, that, that aren't necessarily codified, that aren't written down. You know, if you ask people on the playa, like, what is this about? Why, why do you burn the man? Like, what, what's going on at the temple? Everyone will give you a different answer. Because it, yeah. what's, what's taking place is on the level of <coughs> unarticulated experiences. Sounds like the first 30 years of Christianity, but that's a longer topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks. thanks. Again, Matt. thanks.